just delighted to be here today to, to talk to all of you about something that is near and dear to my heart, which is uh, how to improve relations between India and Pakistan. Uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. But I just wanted to first say uh, what a wonderful initiative the Delaware Lahore Delhi Partnership for Peace effort is. And I, and I really want to commend everybody for the wonderful role that, that, that you all have played to, to develop this because it's exactly these kinds of citizen diplomacy, people to people kinds of efforts that we in the State Department uh, do everything we can to try to encourage. Uh, and the fact that all of you are a part of it is really terrific because we want to, as much as possible, um, involve the young people, uh, not only of the United States, but also the young people of India and Pakistan. Um, we often say that half of the country of India, you know, 1.2 billion people, as well as uh, also of Pakistan, which almost 200 million people, half of their populations are under the age of 25. So it's so important to reach out and make sure that we are involving the young people, we are consulting the young people, talking to the young people. But I also want to do that here in this country. So that's why I really welcomed the opportunity to come here to Delaware and to speak to you today. Um, I thought I would just talk briefly about kind of four main issues. First, maybe just talk very briefly about kind of the history of India-Pakistani relations. Um, talk about some of the recent very encouraging developments that have taken place between those two countries, particularly on the trade front. Um, then talk a little bit about, again, precisely what we were talking about earlier. Uh, a lot of this citizen, people-to-people -people kinds of diplomacy that the United States is um, helping to encourage, particularly between those two countries. And then last, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the Foreign Service. Um, you heard uh, my, uh, the introduction of me. Uh, I've spent 27 years in public service working for the United States government. Most people probably don't know what a diplomat does. So I thought I would just maybe sp spend uh, five or 10 minutes right at the end and tell you a little bit about that and hopefully pique your interest uh, to, uh, to learn more. So let me just start by uh, talking a little bit about the history. I know you've already had one lecture on this, so I won't spend too long on it, but I think it's important to just begin with a bit of the setting of it. And that is, I think most of you know that um, India and Pakistan uh, originally were all part of, of India under, under the British. Uh, and in 1947, uh, India and Pakistan gained their independence from Great Britain from, from, and became independent countries. Uh, and it was, a, you know, it was a very, very difficult time for both of those countries. They were still very, very poor, but uh, they also were very, very proud of the opportunity to, uh, to become independent and to begin to chart their own course together. And you know, I always like to try to recommend books for young people. And I, I, when I remember when I was roughly your age, that one of the books that I read that really got me interested in foreign affairs and really got me interested in India and Pakistan was a terrific book by, called Freedom at Midnight. And it's a book by uh, two journalists, uh, Larry Collins and Dom Dominique Lapierre. And it's a very, very vivid history of precisely this period when uh, these two countries became independent from Britain. And uh, if you all are interested, I really encourage you to read it. It reads like a novel, uh, and it just got a fantastic uh, description uh, of all the great characters, Mahatma Gandhi, Jinnah, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was the founder of Pakistan, Lord Mountbatten of, of uh, Great Britain, and so many other people who uh, had such an important role in this uh, decisive moment in not only the subcontinent's history, but in world history. So it's a really terrific book, and I, I, I commend it to you. You know, since then, uh, India and Pakistan have, have fought three major wars together. And uh, oftentimes they've had, obviously, terrible, terrible differences. But really what, what I want to try to emphasize today is much more uh, how the, the progress that the two countries are making to try to improve relations. 
Um, as was said earlier, uh, I served as the deputy ambassador in India um, from 2003 to 2006. And it, that was, it was quite a momentous time in, in the history of India and the history of Pakistan. Um, it was important um, in terms, first of all, in terms of our own relations with India. Um, India for many, many years was considered a non-aligned country. That is, it didn't want to align itself either with the, the Russians or with the United States. And they were one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement. Um, and all of that uh, kind of began to change after uh, the attacks here on 9-11. The attacks in New York, Pennsylvania, and elsewhere. And um, it all began to change because India, first of all, realized that it had a lot of common interests with the United States, particularly trying to combat terrorism uh, around the world, but particularly uh, terrorism in uh, that part of the world, in South Asia. But also, India, for the first time, began to grow very, very uh, rapidly. And that was the result of economic reforms that had been initiated by the then finance minister of India, uh, Manmohan Singh, who's now the prime minister of India. And those reforms really began to take root uh, in the early part of, of, you know, sort of 2003, 2004. And the growth rate in India went from about 3 or 4% a year to up to 7 or 8% a year. So for the first time, India could really begin to think about uh, becoming a, a great power, not just a regional power, but a great power. And it had the resources for the first time to begin to project its influence overseas. And India understood that if it wanted to project its influence, that it, would, it was in its own interest to have better relations with the United States. And we certainly welcomed that uh, because we saw that India, like us, is a democracy. India has, has a market economy. And India was, is such an important and influential voice in the world. So it was very much in our interest as well to have better relations with India. So that began a, real, a process um, while I was there, really, to, to really begin to double down and try to improve relations with India. Um, the most famous example of that was the decision by then President Bush in uh, 2005 to sign a civil nuclear deal, where for the first time we agreed to uh, engage in uh, civil nuclear cooperation with India to help them to meet their fast rising energy demands uh, and to essentially put behind us what had been decades of disagreements about nonproliferation and about the fact that India had a nuclear weapons program. So this was a big deal uh, in our relations because it essentially took what had been the most significant irritant in our bilateral relations and turned it into a, a, an area of cooperation on the energy side. And uh, I think that's, that was a very important and bold step and uh, something that we're still working on today. But since then, we've of course moved on uh, and have expanded our, our cooperation into virtually every single area of human endeavor, which has been really, really important. Um, turning to Pakistan, um, Pakistan obviously was watching very closely what was going on in India at that time. Um, General Musharraf was both the president of the country but also the head of the military. And I think that Musharraf saw that for the first time um, that Pakistan having fought three wars with India, and having lost three wars with India, um, saw that, it w that India with its very high growth rates, uh, it was going to be more and more difficult for Pakistan to sustain very high levels of military spending but also to be able to meet the social and economic needs of its people. And so they realized that uh, trying to fight their way and to achieve their objectives was really not the way forward and that it would be much better to engage in dialogue. So they began a very wide uh, spread and important series of dialogues between India and Pakistan um, that were very, very successful from about 2004 to about 2007. And they really, really made a, a huge amount of progress. And all of that really, unfortunately, came to a halt. Um, first, because uh, General Musharraf began to have problems domestically in Pakistan. But perhaps even more importantly, 
because of the terrible attacks that occurred in Mumbai uh, on what they call their 2611. Uh, and th these were attacks um, by a terrorist group that was based in Pakistan uh, on the city of Mumbai. I think 166 people were, were killed, more than 300 were injured, and uh, including several Americans were killed. And as a result of that, India immediately suspended the dialogue and all of those contacts that had been made over those previous several years were, were, were stopped for a while. And uh, India obviously made a, wanted to see the people who were responsible for those attacks brought to justice. And um, so things were, the, the relations were in the deep freeze for quite a long time. More recently, things have begun to thaw uh, and the, the countries have begun, to, have begun to talk more about ways that they can cooperate. India and the United States still believe that India, that Pakistan should do more to bring uh, those responsible for the Mumbai attacks to justice. But I think India has also taken the principal view that it's in their own interest to try to expand trade, particularly between India and Pakistan. Um, they're, uh, like us, they want to be sure that Pakistan does not become a failed state uh, Pakistan, as many of you know, now has a, a population roughly of 175 million or so. Because of very high population growth rates, that number, that population is going to double over the next uh, 20 years or so to about 350 million people. So one of the most urgent questions that Pakistan faces is where are all the jobs for all those young people going to come from? And uh, to make sure that they have jobs so that there's not uh, an opportunity for some of these extremist groups that are based in Pakistan to recruit unemployed uh, young Pakistanis. So again, India, I think, realizes it's very much in its own interest to try to prevent that, but it also wants to increase trade because it sees that there are tremendous opportunities for its own business people as well. Um, just to give you a few figures, um, trade between India and Pakistan in, in, in 2003, when I first arrived there, was about $300 million. Now just to give you an example, um, I, I went back and looked at some of the Delaware trade statistics. $300 million is what the state of Delaware uh, has in terms of trade with the country of Sweden. So your, your population is about a million people, the country of Sweden is about 10 million people. So roughly 11 million people trade $300 million worth of good, goods and services. By contrast, the countries of India and Pakistan, which uh, together have about almost 1.4 billion people, were only trading about 300 million. So it just shows you it was a very, very, very small level of trade and there's huge opportunities to do more. Um, so what did they do? First of all, they decided that they should try to reduce some of the barriers that exist to trade between their two countries. Until recently, Pakistan has restricted the number of goods that can be traded uh, to about a thousand products. And again, I think because of the need to create jobs, the need to try to move the peace process along, um, they decided to make some, some major changes. So what were those? First, the Indian and Pakistani commerce ministers have set a goal of trying to double cross-border trade within three years. So that's a big deal. Right now it's about uh, a little bit under three billion dollars. Uh, so they want to try to double that over the next three years. Um, a World Bank study has estimated that if all of the barriers were reduced between the two countries, that uh, trade could jump to between five and ten billion dollars a year, which would be a giant step forward and again would provide large numbers of uh, new job opportunities on both sides, but also help to create stakeholders uh, on both sides for continued progress towards peace. So let me just talk a little bit about a little bit more about some of those benefits and why this is something that's profoundly in all of our interests. Um, first of all, it's well known that uh, when you increase trade, that that's going to be uh, that can be such an important part of increasing growth. 
That's why our own president, President Obama, has uh, made what we call uh, economic statecraft a really important part of our diplomacy. Um, nowadays, American diplomats have as one of their most important jobs to go out and try to help American businesses to find new business opportunities, new trade opportunities in every country that we work in. So again, this economic statecraft, this economic diplomacy is a really important part of it. And that's precisely because that's going to help to create jobs. The more we can export to these countries, the more our companies can produce here and again create jobs that will, be, that will benefit us and benefit the American economy. Um, easing trade barriers can also help to uh, increase private foreign direct investment. The larger the market there is, the more there is, to, the more of an opportunity there is to trade and to sell your goods into a larger market. Um, likewise, if you have greater foreign direct investment, you can um, help to get more what we call technology transfer. And that's been particularly true in India. Um, India, as I said earlier, was once a very poor country, but because of technology transfer, but because of a lot of the reforms that have taken place, it is, the Indian economy is now poised to be the third largest economy in the world in about 15 years' time. And a lot of that is because the, of the great progress that has been made on the technological front to lift large numbers of Indians out of poverty and into the middle class. Let me just give you one example of where there's just tremendous opportunities for trade between the two countries of India and Pakistan. And that's tea. India is the largest producer of tea in the world. You can go to places like Darjeeling, but many, many others, and you'll see just huge uh, estates of tea everywhere you go. Uh, Pakistan is the world's second largest importer of tea. And yet, Pakistan imports less than 1% of its tea from India. So that's a, that's a pretty terrible thing if you think about it. Where does most of Pakistan's tea come from? It comes from Kenya, very, very far away and off on the shores of East Africa. So they're paying very substantial transportation costs for that tea to be imported into Pakistan. Whereas it obviously be much more efficient and much better for those two countries if Pakistan could import most of that tea from Kenya. That's just one example of many of the opportunities for much more substantial trade between the two countries. As I said earlier, greater trade also creates stakeholders. Many of you um, may, may know the famous uh, New York Times columnist, Thomas Friedman. And he's written very knowledgeably about trade and about India and Pakistan. And uh, one, of the, one of the famous remarks that uh, Thomas Friedman has made is that uh, countries that have McDonald's don't tend to go to war with each other. And what does he mean by that? He means that countries that achieve a certain level of development uh, begin to attract more in terms of a service economy. McDonald's then sees that there's a market opening, so they go into those countries. And those, those, uh, when they, once they achieve a certain economic standard, they tend not to go to war and try to resolve uh, their differences peacefully. Let me give you one concrete example of how the business community uh, really helped uh, in, in the India-Pakistan context. Um, those of you who follow in Indian history closely might remember that in 2001, there was an attack uh, on the Indian parliament by terrorists based in Pakistan. And they got very, very close to the Indian parliament. They got actually into the outer perimeter of the Indian parliament um, where eventually they were killed. But it was a very, very close call because the parliament was in session. And had they actually been able to penetrate the security perimeter, they would have been able to kill large numbers of very, very senior leaders of India. So that was a, a, quite a wake up call for, for India. Uh, and obviously India, there, were, there was huge pressure on the government to try to retaliate. Uh, and India began to mobilize to, uh, to take action against Pakistan. And what, what, one of the interesting things that happened was that the business communities on both sides mobilized as well. Because they realized 
that, th that war between their two countries was profoundly not in their interests. So they each began to lobby um, their, their respective governments to try to prevent war and to try to get, to try to encourage dialogue and to resolve their differences peacefully. Um, we also, the United States and many other countries, were involved diplomatically to try to, again, de-escalate tensions. And eventually the decision was made not to pursue military action. But uh, that, I think that's a very good example of how the business communities were involved and, and again, were important stakeholders in helping the, to, 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 to discourage military action. Um, let me just talk a little bit about the sort of wider benefits of trade as well. Why, does, why, does, why do we care so much about trade between India and Pakistan? We care about it first because there are two countries that matter a great deal to the United States, but it also matters a great deal to the neighborhood. Um, many of you have heard about how uh, now we are entering a very crucial phase in Afghanistan. Uh, and we're, we're calling that the transition. Uh, and there, there are actually three transitions that are occurring in Afghanistan. There's a security transition, which is that our troops and, all, and all most of the NATO troops are going to leave Afghanistan by the end of 2014. And in return, we are doing everything we can to build up and train the Afghan National Security Forces so they will be able to take full responsibility for their own security. So that's called the security transition. Separately, they're going to be, there's a political transition that will occur uh, with important elections that will occur in April of 2014, presidential elections in, in uh, Afghanistan. And the third is the economic transition that will occur in Afghanistan. And that's something that I actually work quite a lot on because I'm responsible for the countries of Central Asia, which are just north of uh, Afghanistan, and then all the countries of South Asia, which are just to, uh, to the east of Pakistan. One of our most important interests is to try to increase trade and integration between South and Central Asia. Now why, do, why does that matter to us? It matters because uh, in this very important transition that is occurring in Afghanistan, we again want to make sure that as we leave, that we leave uh, as stable an economy as possible in Afghanistan. Uh, and that as uh, American and other international assistance perhaps falls a little bit, and also spending by our military falls, there's obviously going to be some impact on the, on the uh, Afghan economy. So how do, we, how do we want to try to mitigate that? We want to do everything we can to try to create more of a private sector-based economy and a trade-based economy in Afghanistan. And how do you do that? Because it's a very small country still, and it's a re re relatively poor country. And the best way to do that is to increase regional integration. Again, to create larger markets so that people have the incentive to invest and trade with Afghanistan and then perhaps to export to other countries. So uh, last year, my boss, Secretary Hillary Clinton, went to uh, Chennai, India. And she gave a very, very important speech in which she talked about what she called the New Silk Road. And the New Silk Road, in her vision, was to try to build up a network of, high, of roads, of railways, of electricity transmission lines, of energy pipelines, to try to better integrate the countries of South and Central Asia and to help Afghanistan with this very, very important economic transition. So we're hard at work on this. Uh, in fact, just last week I was in Afghanistan and I traveled up to, the, to northern Afghanistan to Mazar-e-Sharif and then up to the border with Uzbekistan. And it was precisely to try to encourage the development of these rail lines, of these roads and bridges between the countries. And then to also talk to the, uh, the business people in northern Afghanistan about how what we might help to build ties between their business community and the business communities of Central Asia, but also India. Um, so that's a good example of how American diplomacy is trying to help in this very, very strategically important part of the world. So the New Silk Road is a very Im important aspect of our diplomatic efforts right now. And what would help the New Silk Road the most would be if traders 
if, let's say, a trucker uh, who wants to ship a goods from anywhere in India could have the opportunity to go through Pakistan, through Afghanistan, and then up into Central Asia and beyond. That's called transit trade. So that, again, goods and services could move more freely. Right now, um, it's still very hard to do because uh, the transit trade between India and Pakistan is still not moving very quickly. And then Indian goods still are not able to go up to Afghanistan freely. So the first step in kind of resolving that is to have improved India-Pakistan relations. And so these two countries are making very, very good progress on this. And that's obviously very, very encouraging. And the hope is that over time, uh, there will be further progress between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And again, the transit routes through, through the entire region will, can be opened up. And that will provide trade and other benefits for all of the people of that region. And uh, so again, that's something that's profoundly in our interest. You create jobs, you create more stability, you create economic opportunity for these young people, you diminish the possibility of people being recruited by terrorist groups, and you increase the possibility of creating a solid economy, a market economy, and again, greater opportunities for all the people of this region. <clears throat> Let me just talk a little bit about people-to-people -people ties, because I think that's really, really important as well. Um, I was talking earlier about, uh, a, again, a very direct example that I, that I had of this when I was in India. And I recall very vividly that um, one of the important things that went on while uh, I was there as India and Pakistan from 2004 to 2007 were making progress in their relations was that they also recognized the importance of people-to-people -people ties. And they understood that these two peoples are basically from the same roots. They have so much in common and so much that unites them. And yet, mostly they focus on what divides them. And that's a real shame. So the two governments understood that it was very much in their interest to try to do more to increase people-to-people -people contacts. And that would, in, in, in turn, give impetus and, and provide sort of ballast to the relationship. So one of, the th one of the things they did that was really wonderful was they decided that they would pursue sports diplomacy. Now all you guys play sports, I'm sure, and uh, it's one of the greatest ways to increase mutual understanding. Now what's the, who can tell me what the most important sport is in India and Pakistan? It's cricket, exactly. So these are two of the greatest countries these are two of the greatest cricket playing countries in the world. And, you know, if you think your rivalries here in Delaware mean a lot, it means it, it is nothing compared to the rivalry between India and Pakistan on the cricket pitch. So the Indians decided that they would send their cricket team to Pakistan. And this was a big deal. And I remember that a lot of my Indian friends were a little bit worried. They didn't know really how the, the cricket team would be received. Many Indians were gonna go with the team as well. And what did they find? They found that in fact, they received an incredibly warm welcome from the people of Pakistan. And every Indian that I knew who went on that trip came back and they had the most wonderful stories about how hospitable the Pakistani people had been. No one had ever let them to buy their own meal. Everybody treated them everywhere. Everybody welcomed them to their homes. And it was a great example of how these kinds of people-to-people -people ties can really help to build greater understanding and build momentum and popular support for the government efforts that were underway to try to improve relations between those two countries. So that's what people-to-people -people diplomacy is all about. We try to do a lot of that ourselves. We, because it's so much in our interest as Americans to have improved relations between India and Pakistan, we try to help wherever we can. And there are several good examples of how we help. Um, I, I try to think of some examples involving young people because it might be of more interest to you. One of the great things that we support is a, a program called Seeds for Peace. And Seeds for Peace is originally started in the Middle East. And the idea was to bring uh, young Israelis and young Palestinians together and to try to just develop mutual understanding 
and break down a lot of the uh, myths that each of them had about the other. Uh, and it was a very successful program, so they decided to extend it to include Indians and Pakistanis and Afghans. Uh, again, all of them people your age, and they'd come together and they send them, they come to the United States and they send them to a camp in Maine. And they spend several weeks together in this camp and they talk, they have seminars where they talk to each other, but they also do sports and they do all kinds of activities together. And what do you know? At the end of it, all these kids have stopped, kind of ha have abandoned all of their previous kind of preconceived views about each other. They have a much better understanding of each other and of their, of their countries and most importantly of their shared histories and their shared values and how much they have in common with each other. And what's great about it is that it creates these networks. And so these young people exchange emails with each other, exchange Facebook accounts, and they begin to have a conversation. And that conversation now because of social media is, is becoming much more extensive and it's such an important part of, again, building bridges, building trust, building confidence between these two people uh, that are so important to the United States. So Seeds of Peace is one example of what we did. We also do a lot of um, different kinds of youth exchanges. Um, I have with me Amy Steinman, uh, who's from our, what we call our public diplomacy office in, uh, at the State Department. So one of Amy's jobs is to help to develop these kinds of uh, exchange programs. Um, I'll give you a few more examples of, of those of the kinds of things that we've tried to support. Another one was uh, the first ever India-Pakistan soccer exchange where teams from both sides came together and played together but more importantly just you know spent time together and again became friends both on the field but also off the field. In 2011, last year, we brought five Pakistani students and five Indian students to Huntsville, Alabama to the U.S. Space and Rocket Center. So again, these are literally rocket scientists uh, of your age and your generation who were brought together um, because of their common love for science and their common love for astronomy. And again, the hope is that over time we'll be able to um, have them work together and there, there are literally hundreds of such programs, and not all of them are sponsored by the U.S. government. A lot of them are sponsored by wonderful leaders like this to, again, to bring people together and increase mutual understanding. It, it, it's on the business side, among artists, among so many other uh, walks of life. And it's something that we really strongly support because, again, it's, it's at the root of increasing friendship is to have those people-to-people -people friendships. Um, let me just conclude by talking a little bit about the State Department and uh, a, a career in the Foreign Service because um, some of you might be interested but you probably don't know very much about what an American diplomat does. What, what is the State Department? Very simply, um, we, are, uh, we serve our country like people in the military but we don't have guns. We go home, we, we go out overseas, we serve in embassies, and we, have a, we perform a variety of different functions. When you join the Foreign Service, you have to take an exam. It's a, an exam that anybody can take. There's a written exam and then there's an oral exam if you pass the written exam. And you, uh, you, you come in in any of several what, what are called cones. So you can either be an economic officer or a political officer, a management officer, a consular officer, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about each one of these things, or a public diplomacy officer. And just to give you very brief examples of what each of those do, if you're an economic officer serving in India or Pakistan, your job essentially is to try to help American business to develop export opportunities and perhaps investment opportunities as well, but also to help American companies when they get in trouble. You know, sometimes American companies, they, they, they will export something to a country and then they don't get paid. And so they, you know, obviously they're a little bit upset about that because they've delivered their goods and then they don't get paid. So where, who do they turn to for that? They turn to the American Embassy to an economic officer. And we go in and um, talk to the company directly or we talk to the government to try to get them to oblige the company to pay. Uh, and th you know, that's, that's a very concrete example of what we do. But the most important thing is again to help them. So typically an American business person will come over to India, let's say, 
and they, they won't necessarily have very good contacts. They don't know who that to really talk to about who they might be able to sell their goods to. So our, our team at the U.S. Embassy will arrange for them to meet companies that might be interested in importing goods from the United States. So that's a very good example of how we sort of facilitate trade and try to improve job opportunities for Americans here in this country. Political officers. Political officers are often a lot just like um, uh, journalists. Uh, political officers are out there uh, reporting on local conditions uh, and what it means for the United States. So I'll give you an example. India just had a, um, a, a shuffle of their cabinet. They changed some of their cabinet members. There was a new foreign minister and uh, several other new ministers, a new minister of human resources development, which is the, basically uh, education. So the, the political team at the American Embassy in New Delhi uh, wrote a series of cables about who were the new ministers, why were, were these changes made, and what does it mean for the United States? Are these, are these new ministers people that, w that we can work with? Are they favorable to the United States? How can we expand cooperation in those areas? So that was th those were cables that were done by political officers. They're also out there uh, in, in other countries uh, where relations may not be so good, um, doing more sensitive kinds of work. Uh, in many countries around the world, for example, we are advocating for human rights. And in many countries, uh, the citizens of those countries often are arrested, they're tortured, uh, or facing various other kinds of human rights abuses. And we advocate for those people, and we encourage progress on human rights, and we certainly encourage countries not to engage in tor torture. And we bring up specific cases. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that I, I lived in Tunisia. One, I was a political officer in Tunisia, and, I, and one of my biggest jobs at that time was working on torture and working on trying to improve freedom of expression, freedom of the media, and again, engaging in advocacy with the government but also talking to the civil society, to the, to the human rights groups in Tunisia to try to make sure that there was sufficient space for them to be able to operate, for them to be able to make their own advocacy. Uh, so that's another very important part of what a, a, a political officer does. A consular officer. Now most people think of consular officers of the people that uh, issue visas, and that's certainly an important part of what they do. So when an, when an Indian or a Pakistani wants to come to the United States, they need a visa, so they go to the American Embassy and uh, they apply for a visa. But uh, consular officers do a lot more than that. And one of their most important jobs is to help American citizens. Uh, and that can be everything from, you know, you're in a place and somebody pickpockets you and takes your wallet and your passport. So we're, who's going to help you? You go to the American Embassy and they'll issue you a new passport. If necessary, they'll, they'll even loan you money so you can uh, get back to the United States. Uh, if, you're, if you're put in jail for some reason, within 24 hours, there's a requirement that the host government let the American Embassy know that there's an American citizen in jail. And right away, we will send somebody to that jail to make sure that uh, you are being well treated, that you have enough food, that you have, if necessary, medical attention if you need it. Uh, and we're there essentially to try to protect your rights, to make sure that you're going to be treated fairly and you're also going to be treated within the, the, the confines of the law. Um, administrative officers, management officers, are there to help provide the diplomatic platform. We have these huge embassies around the world, but somebody's got to actually make sure that uh, we have buildings, we have the computers, we have everything that we need to make sure that we can operate around the world. And that's a really challenging job sometimes. Uh, so that's a really exciting one. And then last but not least are the public diplomacy officers. And the public diplomacy officers are people like Amy, who, uh, whose job it is not only to develop things like exchanges, but also to explain America and explain American policy. Uh, and you know, oftentimes uh, foreigners don't know very much about the United States. And so it's really helpful to have people who can speak the language and who can go out and, and, and explain to uh, local people wherever you are about what we're trying to do, what our objectives are. If, if something happens in the United States that they may not agree with, we can try to explain why we're doing that and it's not necessarily something that's against that country, but something that we're doing to promote our own interests. 
So in each one of these areas, uh, you have a chance to serve your country and you have a chance to make a difference. I think, you know, when I first joined the Foreign Service 27 years ago, I didn't really know if I was going to stay in the Foreign Service. But the reason I've stayed for 27 years is that every single day of my life, I felt like I was making a difference in helping somebody. Uh, be it an American business person, be it somebody who was in trouble, or uh, let's say somebody who was being tortured somewhere. And I, you know, I could go, go home at the end of the day and feel some satisfaction that I'd made a difference in somebody's life. And that's a really wonderful thing to be able to say. And to be able to also be serving your country overseas is, is, is such a privilege and such a wonderful opportunity to travel, meet a lot of new people, and to just experience new cultures. So that's why I've stayed in the Foreign Service for 27 years. And you know, I really encourage you all to think about a career um, in, in the Foreign Service, in the State Department. And, you know, there, there are a lot of ways that you could kind of get more information about it. There, you can go onto the web, uh, www.careers.state.gov, and you can just Google that if you want. Uh, and there's a whole website about, how, about careers and how you take the exam and so forth. It's all free. Um, but even more importantly, uh, you know, you can g try to go apply for an internship. There are, there are lots of wonderful internships, particularly in the summer. You know, if you want to go and get a summer job, uh, typically, m m typically, usually that's while people are in college. And you can go and work at an embassy for a summer and just see what it's like. And it's, really, and it's a really terrific opportunity. Many of the people who, are in, who are, s serve as interns go on to have a career because they just, they find they really love the work and they love the travel and they love the, the opportunity to work with other people, serve in foreign cultures, and again, serve your country. Let me just conclude by, again, thanking the wonderful organizers of today's uh, lecture and this whole, this whole partnership uh, and to thank all of you for your interest in India and Pakistan and to just encourage you to, to sustain your interest in foreign affairs. We really need people who, who are knowledgeable about foreign affairs. You don't necessarily even have to work in government to work in the business sector, to work um, in civil society, to work in so many other areas. And the kinds of things that are being done today with this Partnership for Peace are just such an important part of overall efforts to improve understanding and to improve peace prospects between countries that are important like India and Pakistan. So again, thank you so much for this great opportunity and now I, I look forward to your questions.